Welcome to Tonko Cast number nine.、Uh, this month's guests are Marine Fan and Eric Darnell. And both of them are founders of Baobab Studios, a VR studio here in the Bay Area. Yeah, we've known Maureen for a long time since Pixar days, and she helped a lot of our side projects, including The Dam Keeper. Yeah, and Eric Darnell has been in the industry for a long time. He directed、uh, Ants and also a lot of the Madagascar films from PDI DreamWorks. We had a pretty exciting conversation with them, so enjoy. I think we were both really interested to talk both, to both of you guys because VR is something that's really happening a lot, especially in the Bay Area.、Um, and we haven't gotten to see Invasion yet. At some point, we'll come visit Baobab and get to see the whole thing. And,、uh, and one of the connections between us and, and what you guys are doing is also your art director, or is Cody an art director?、Uh, but Cody was one of our painters on the Dam Keeper, and we worked with you, Marie. But、um, how did、uh, well? Where did Baobab start? Like you guys, where did you guys meet and Baobab kind of start?、Uh, so I've always wanted to do animation my entire life. I had a tiger mom who told me that I shouldn't. So、uh, various jobs I had, you know, eBay, whatever.、Um, even Zynga. The entire time I still wanted to do animation, which is why. I wanted to always work with you guys on all the short things that you guys were doing, no matter what it was. I just wanted to be involved、um, in animation community,、um, and I always wanted to start it, but it didn't seem to make sense to me from a business perspective at the time because I was like, "Oh, am I going to go compete against? If I were to start a studio, would I compete against Pixar or Disney?"、Um, I would need a large amount of money to be able to do that or distribution advantage. So、it didn't make quite sense,、um, but the first time that I put on a VR headset, to be honest, I wasn't as excited because <laughs> it was live action, and all I could notice was the pixels and the poor resolution because our standards for reality are super high,、um, and so there was just disparity.、Mm -hmm. But the first time the engineers on my game team hacked our game at Zynga into、mm -hmm. The headset. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the future of animation because it was an animated、uh, CG world. And when it's animated or a CG world, you have suspension of disbelief, and you no longer care about the pixels or the resolution. You're just like, I'm there in the world. So I'm like, oh, this is great. Not only creatively because it's the next step forward in animation. Because the reason why I always loved animation is you feel like you're in the world, and the world is so real that you think you could reach out and touch it. And the last thing that I just said, which is the world is so real that you think you could touch it, is the definition of VR. So I thought animation and VR as mediums were perfect for each other.、Um, that's on the creative side, but on the business side, it also made sense because it's technological disruption, which means that it kind of levels the playing field for you know anybody to start. So it made sense both on a creative and on a business side. And I met Eric through、uh, Glenn Entis, who's one of our advisors. So Glenn Dantis is a co-founder、um, of PDI DreamWorks Animation, and he was also at EA. He was the CTO there, and also chief visual officer. So he knew Eric from PDI.、Um, so he introduced me to Eric a while before I decided to start the company. When I decided to start the company, and the first person I wanted to have join was Eric. So I had Glenn reintroduce us, and then so we just started.、Um, Talking and seeing if we enjoyed working together, and actually, Eric can talk about what he thought about meeting, <laughs> about why he joined. Well, I had、um, worked、um, in the feature film world since around 1996, and、um, so just about 20 years.、Um, you know, directed I guess five films, and you know, I. I I honestly, I think I kind of already had one foot out the door,、um, and then DreamWorks consolidated everybody down to LA, and I had a clause in my contract that they could never force me to go to LA.、Mm -hmm. Now, nothing against LA, but the last time we left, I promised my wife we'd never go back. I think it was just one too many flaming minivans on the freeway or <laughs> dinner in, but.、Um, uh, So I really wasn't sure what I was. I was actually working on an art installation project that、um, I put aside. Now I met because I met Marine and she、um, 
had a VR headset and I put it on and it just kind of blew me away. It's one of those things that you can't really describe to people. You kind of just have to put on a headset. And um, I figured, why not? Let's go. Marine's smart. She went to Harvard. <laughs> I don't know anything about business, but she does. So, um, yeah. So that's what we did. And then we were funded last August. Uh, and uh, we're off to the races. Awesome. And that... Uh that first feeling of like, like you have, you know, quite a history in making feature films. Um, when you put on that headset, what what like? Because we've both tried on a headset, and it's amazing to me how, uh, like you said, you can't really. You have to put it on. You kind of have to see it. But as far as storytelling, it's completely different than well, it's different than feature filmmaking. Um, what, what did you immediately think about was exciting as a director, as a storyteller, about VR? Well, one thing was just, um, in my first experience, it, there wasn't a story. It was just just the immersion of it, you know? I'm underwater and here comes a turtle. You know, I mean, whatever it was. It, it, but just the potential, I think, for any kind of, um, any kind of thing in VR, um, was was clearly huge um but you know i i love to play games but i i'm not interested in creating them i don't have any history creating them vr and games are kind of like a match made in heaven in in many ways but um when i got talking with maureen um you know we kind of shared this vision of you know what could storytelling do in vr and you're you're right it's it's very different um, and yet it's it's the same. It's it's just like, you know, well, VR is not just an extension of cinema. It is its own medium. Um, and you can't apply, you can't come in to VR production with a movie making um, toolbox. You you have to come you have to come in with a VR making toolbox. And most of us don't even know what should be in that toolbox yet. We're, dis we're discovering that right now. Um, but, you know, the thing that's always struck me about, you know, movies or theater or literature is that they all have a very unique set of tools to accomplish what it is they're trying to accomplish. But their higher level goal, for the most part, is the same. It's having a great story and telling it well with characters that you care about and perhaps even fall in love with, all that good stuff. And so that just seemed like a really interesting challenge. How do we serve that higher goal, make that our number one priority, and do it in VR? And it was a big question mark. If the, the first piece that we, we made is called Invasion, if we had put out the, the invasion that I envisioned when we started, it would have been a... a disaster <laughs> because you know none of us knew what we were doing and so we had to make a lot of discoveries along the way um, and and you know recognize the differences between VR and cinema to um, come up with something that was gonna potentially work um, I mean, you know right now both Rob and I you know, came from feature film, but not uh, in the story department or the directing, like we came from art department. And we're trying to do, in a way, what you've accomplished in your career, like directing a feature film, like that we're just super excited. And now you're kind of, um, uh, maybe not necessarily leaving that uh, territory, but at least you're, you know, you're making that transition to a, such a new, territory which is so inspiring for a lot of us in the community um, but uh, I'm just curious if it's okay to talk a little bit more about your career as a director you know I think a lot of listeners who listen to our podcast are in the animation community and they just want to hear more about like how you came about as a director like how you started uh, at PDI is, is that where you started your animation <coughs> career or I essentially started at PDI mm -hmm. yeah um, I got involved in animation though a lot earlier than that. I, I was a journalist and journalist journalism major at the uh, University of Colorado, and um, in the broadcast specialty, and um, I had questions for my teachers about well how do you how do you shoot a 
a journalism story? How do you compose a shot? How do you edit them? And nobody was teaching that, which I thought to be really odd for a broadcast journalism major. Um, but then, you know, I looked around and pretty much all the other students, they, all, they just all wanted to be the anchor on TV. Mm -hmm. That's what that meant to them. So I started taking classes in the film school and they had a, um, um, a couple of great teachers and, and one of them was Stan Brackage, who's a famous avant-garde or experimental filmmaker from the last century, one of the most famous, I, I suppose. And um, he was just a remarkably inspiring guy. So that by the time I graduated with my journalism degree, I was determined to be an experimental filmmaker, even if I lived in a mud hut for the rest of my life. It's easy to be idealistic when you're in your early 20s. Um, and so the work I was doing was, um, a lot of it was direct animation, animation directly on the film itself. Um, I, I made a, a collage film out of colored acetate and... Um, and live-action footage that I'd shot where you know each frame was a little collage of these elements including sequential pieces from live-action films so there's little things walking around and moving in in, in that world um, and then that that led me to a job directing an REM video which gave me a little bit of credibility and then um, um, also it led me to CalArts where I Got, got into the experimental animation department. So I was kind of, I was like waiting tables and working construction and um, doing whatever I needed to do to, to pay the rent. Um, but since 1982 or so, I, I'm sorry, 1970, was it that long ago? No, 82. I was basically, I considered myself a, a filmmaker. Um, and I was also really interested in computers, which was experimental at the time. And so I got involved in that in CalArts and... Um, and then in 1991, I got my first job at PDI as an intern and then was hired there. And then we were doing a lot of TV commercials and morphing the front end of the 1992 Ford truck into the front end of the 93 Ford trucks. Like, wow, look, the blinker light went all the way, slid all the way around. And, the, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, uh, we really wanted to do entertainment and it was really tough because nobody had done it. And then Pixar came out with Toy Story and um, that really opened the door and then DreamWorks wanted to get their foot in that door and uh, actually came to, by that time I had gone to DreamWorks because I wanted to do entertainment. Within nine months I was back at PDI directing Ants, which was the first animated film of any kind that DreamWorks released back I think in 98. Um, and then from there I went on to be a writer and director on all the um, Madagascar franchise films up through the penguins of Madagascar. And I say that because you never know how many more Madagascar movies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I think, you know, for me, it's like I, I was always, I, I think one of the things that helped me um, get through it all is that I just always considered myself a filmmaker and I didn't care. I told myself I didn't care if, if nobody liked my stuff. But as long as I felt good about it and I didn't feel like I was selling myself out that I could feel good about what I was doing and I could happily wait tables <laughs> or do whatever else I needed to do to make money and so it was sort of with that attitude that I went to PDI and in my spare time there was nothing more important to me than to continue to make my own films so I made one and a half short films there um, which is part of what Katzenberg saw that you know he didn't have anybody else that had made a computer animated short film, so I might as well let this guy try it. Um, and so I think that's kind of how I got Gas my first Planet. job. Yeah. yeah, Gas Planet. And then I was kind of halfway through. I had about a minute done on another piece. Um, but um, so, you know, and I always tell when people ask, like, how, you, how do you break into being, you know, an animator or a filmmaker? And I say that you don't have to break into anything. You can do it right mm -hmm. now. You know, wow, you don't need any permission. You know, you need permission from somebody if you want to be a brain surgeon or um, a five-star general. But um, if you want to be an artist, you can. There's only one um, one thing that you have to do, and that is to do it right, make art, um, and then you never know. That, that that is that part of the reason why you got connected with Eric in a way that. Marine, like if I think of you, like you have that personality too. You don't necessarily wait for permission or anybody to tell you, hey, you should do this. You kind of do it. Like ever since we met you the first time, you interned at Pixar, 
you had you possess that kind of quality. You always kind of went after what you want. <laughs> I just saw Eric. I was like, oh my gosh, if he says yes to joining me, that will be the most awesome thing. It wasn't really part of a master plan. I think starting a company, though, anybody can start a company. It's really hard, <laughs> really, really hard to start a company. But I think for that, it just requires a ton of passion because it's really difficult. So you have to want it really bad, and also from. Everything I had ever heard of from all my entrepreneur friends, or even business school and all that, it's it can be very lonely, and you're much more likely to be successful if you have a partner. And it's not really just to have a partner to do things, um, to split the workload. It's more having a partner as someone that becomes, in a way, your best friend. That when you're going through really difficult times or really happy times, someone to be able to share all of that with and can. Like feel the same pain. <laughs> you're feeling the pain and happy when you're feeling happy. So I was really happy to find Eric. And they say it's really important to spend a lot of time with your co-founder before choosing a co-founder. Make sure you guys work well together. But we didn't really do that. <laughs> we, <spent a> <laughs> we didn't have together. time. <laughs> and then we're like, let's just do it. And then it turned out really well. And actually, our third co-founder, Larry Cutler. Um, Uh, Eric knew of him at DreamWorks, but didn't. I don't think he worked that much with him. Mm -mm. Yeah, I didn't know him directly. I had met him because I was, I had wanted to go to art school, but the deadlines had passed, so I applied to business school. Tiger Mom wanted me to go to business school, and I got in and didn't want to go, and so I emailed everyone in the Stanford alumni network that had anything to do with animation to get advice about whether or not to go to business school or not. And he was one of the people who responded, and so that's how. Wow. And at the time, wow. so he had left Pixar, where he right he was on, which means again, Toy Story two and Monsters and Buzz Life. So really early, and he was the global head of character tech at DreamWorks. So we connected, and he was giving me advice. Funny thing is, most people told me not to go to business school, but I went anyway. But afterwards, we kept on connecting because he always wanted to do a startup, hmm. and I would. I went to Zynga startup, so we just kept in touch. And then, um, after I decided to do the company, I ran into him at a Chinese New Year's parade in San Francisco, where his daughter was doing a fan dance thing. And then I was like, "Larry," and he's like, "Oh, what are you doing?" I'm like, "Oh, I'm thinking about starting a company." And he's like, "Oh, we should talk." <laughs> and so, wow. I think it was within a month that Eric, Larry, and I all connected. With each other, it's almost like it was meant to be, and then it just so happened that a lot of my business school classmates happened to have become venture capitalists. So then I knew how to get money, um, and then Glenn introduced us to Alvy Roy Smith to become the co-founder of Pixar to become our advisor, and then Kevin Lin was my really good friend, the CEO co-founder of Twitch, and so he helped me through the fundraise. It's just like all our friends just came together, and then Mireille Soria was a producer. Of um, the Madagascar films with Eric, so close to Eric, and she's now the president of DreamWorks Animation. So then she wanted to help Eric out. So this, we all like formed everything, hmm. like within a very short period. And then Glenn also, you know, Alvi then introduced us to Glenn Keane. <laughs> so it was a fu- it was a snowball, but very fortunate that it all happened. Though I know as a woman, I should never say I'm lucky. I made it. <laughs> she did make it happen. No. No. Marine is very tenacious. Yes. How long has Baobab? When was the start of Baobab? What's like day one? I think we started um, August September, so the company has been in existence for nine. Is it nine? I can't do math right now. Almost ten. Ten nine ten months. Yeah. So it's been a wild ride. Wow. So you guys built a studio. Worked on your first, do you call them short films or? Yes, short experiences, <laughs> VR short experiences. Experience. And you guys are kind of, I mean, that's been getting a lot of press. We've been reading about it and a lot of festival traction and really, I mean, congrats on all the success. I mean, what, uh, you know, it's a first project. We know from a first project and that, you know, you kind of have this inkling of like, I, I want to do this. You try things, you learn things, and then you kind of move on. What are, what are you guys excited about right now? Like, what did you learn from doing Invasion, and kind of where are you guys going with with it? Mm. Um, 
Well, you know, I was, you hear this buzzword a lot, empathy with VR. And um, I was, I was kind of skeptical. I, it felt like it was kind of a lot of hype. And, um, you know, the kind of the first person entertainment experiences that people are accustomed to typically are games where you know, you're the hero, you've got to go out there and kill the zombies or solve the puzzle or get to the next level. And it's always about you, 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 you know, me, me, me. What do I need to do now? How do I win? How do I get to the top of the, of the hill? And um, my concern was that um, if you were in a VR world where you were a participant in the world, that, that it could become this ego-driven experience. And, I, and, and, you know, for me, that would have been a failure. If it's one of these things where, like, okay, here's a fake computer animated character, and what am I supposed to do, you know, so that I can get to the next level or move on into the next part of the story or whatever. And, and, and so it was like a, you know, my concern is it would be a very ego-driven sort of challenge-based, you know, goal-driven kind of a thing. Um, but what we discovered is that um, when this little bunny, you know, for those who haven't seen it, you start out and you're just on this frozen lake, snow is falling, and it's beautiful, thanks to our art director, Cody. Thank you, Cody. And... Um, uh, this rabbit comes out and spots you, looks you right in the eye, and hops across the ice and gets right in your face and sniffs you. And the people's response to just that simple bit of eye contact was really um, astonishing to me. You know, it's 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 just the the simple feeling of communication that that is something that comes naturally in VR when it's done a certain way when you're not using mouse or a keyboard or any kind of um, unusual input device. All you're doing is looking at this character and she's looking at you saying, you're a part of my world and that makes me feel a certain way. And then in this case, it makes the bunny feel happy. And people are just, they're just charmed by that. You know, they're just delighted by it for the most part. And um, and then the bunny like starts to kind of hop around in front of you like a dog, like it wants to play. And some people would sort of mirror that action, which is something that that we do, you know, when we like somebody else. You you know, you see two lovers having having dinner together. They'll both have their hand on their their chin on their hand or whatever. I mean, they match each other's posture, and um, you know, the the responses were were just really interesting. And then at one point, the bunny gets goes behind you and hides from. The villain looking over your shoulder looking into your eyes and then back out at the villain and back into your eyes again and um people said it was almost they, they were almost flummoxed some of them when they take they finish the experience and they take off the headset and go that was such a weird feeling when the bunny was behind me i i felt like this weird urge to protect her i mean i knew it was fake i know i'm just standing here in your office but i just had this weird feeling that surprised me um Alvy Ray Smith, who um, came to check it out at one point, he said it was so bizarre because when I turned away from the bunny to watch what the alien was doing, I could still feel the bunny's presence mm -hmm. behind me. Mm -hmm. She didn't even exist, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, except maybe in ones and zeros off somewhere. But she's not, you know, even in his field of view yet. He said I can almost feel the breath of that bunny on the back of my neck. So there's there's things that were happening to people viscerally. And there is a visceral response that you can get in VR that you just really can't get in any other medium. Like, if, you know, if there's a VR experience where I'm standing on the edge of a cliff, I, will, I cannot force myself to take a step, even though I know it would just be another step onto carpeting. <laughs> My reptile brain says, no way are you going that way. And so I think that sort of just surprised me, and I think it's, it's, it's a... It's a testament to the unique and, and, and amazing power that VR has um, to offer. And so for me, I think that is uh, one of the things in VR that, that I want, want to really pursue more deeply is trying to figure out ways to make these connections, to have this, in quotes, communication with the characters in the world and do it in a way um, so that the kind of actions that the audience is taking are actions that are compassionate actions based on empathy, not, um, not self-serving actions based on winning or, you know, 
getting something for themselves. And in, in essence, sort of simulating the kind of actions that one might take in the real world. You know, if it's a game and you're walking through Central Park and you see a girl crying on a park bench, you go, well, I better go talk to that girl so I can learn what happened to her because maybe that'll give me a clue to get to the next level. But if it's happening in real life, it's like you need to make a choice to do something and it's all going to be driven by what, what are you going to do to help that little girl on the park bench. And so if we can find experiences like that, they'll feel emotionally real. Um, and I'm not saying we're going to trick the audience into believing it's real. Um, but... Maybe even that one day. <laughs> one day we'll we'll have the hollow deck and and probably sooner than we think. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Maureen? You know, like the the effect of VR and the potential of VR is so huge. And in terms of like where it goes, uh, like in five, ten years, maybe not even five, ten years. Huh? Like it's. Like, Two three years probably makes a huge difference in VR. Seems like. Uh, where does it go? Like, is that like, are you guys thinking about making a feature length kind of a longer format or a completely new genre? Like, what what would be the future? Right for we can talk about tactics and then also mission. So tactics-wise, I think VR is going to take longer than everybody thinks it is to become mass market, because I believe, um, thank you, Anita Elberse, who's my business school professor, <laughs> teaching me this, but she uh, always, she looked through the trends of history and we see that technology usually takes longer um, to disrupt than everybody thinks, but when it does, the disruption is much greater than everybody believes it will be. So. I know there's a lot of hype around VR, and uh, obviously we believe it because we wouldn't have staked our entire careers and company on it. Um, that being said, we are, you know, always honest with our investors and everybody out there that we think it's going to take a while because um, not only do people have to get their hands on these headsets, a lot of them are very expensive, though the mobile headsets are a lot cheaper, so people can get that. But there's not enough content, so even if people were to get all these headsets, there are not enough people creating. Experiences out there, and so we're looking forward to more people creating stuff. So there's reasons for people not only to purchase the headsets, but repeatedly put the headset back on to see new experiences. So we do think it's going to take time, and right now I think everybody is in the learning phase. And so when you want to learn, you probably want to do things in shorter format than a longer format because if the technology is changing so quickly. And the creative language that we're figuring out is changing so quickly. You don't want to lock yourself into creating something really long because by the time it comes out, you would have spent a lot of time on it, and the technology would all be outdated. <laughs> you couldn't put all the cool stuff that you put in. But also because the headsets are just not that comfortable yet, and we have preliminary data that shows people don't necessarily want to put it on for a long time. So we don't want our audience members to feel uncomfortable. So by doing short. Shorter content, it makes sense from a you know audience perspective. They're comfortable, but also from a business technology perspective, it also makes sense.、Um, but yeah, for sure, in the super future, once it's mass market, the monetization models are figured out and all that, I can totally see long form content as well. But from a mission perspective,、um, the mission of the company was always to、um, inspire, your, bring out your sense of wonder, and inspire people to dream. And the way we came up with that mission is, it's the reason why I've always loved animation. When I,、um, there's so much pressure in society to conform、um, to wanting to get more money, fame, power, and I definitely felt this through the many different places I've been. It's in a way a rat race. Um, but I know that whenever I'm around you guys, for example, this is honest. Whenever I'm around you guys, I feel like you don't care if I name drop. You don't care about any of these things. You just care about the purity of the idea itself. And when I'm watching animation for those 90 minutes or the cartoon or whatever short thing, I believe that I am in that world, and I believe that it's real, and I believe I can do anything, and that anything is possible. Because these worlds, nobody could have thought of except you know some crazy creative genius and. For like all those people who are creating it to make it seem like it was made by one person, and that that world is totally believable, that is super magical. And so, when I walk out of watching an animated film, I think 
I can do anything. <laughs> anything is possible. There's so much more potential and I should go for my dreams. And if there is a way to get everybody to feel that, I feel people would stop confining themselves or constraining themselves to this like societal rules of the rat race and they would actually pursue the things that they really truly want to and realize that they have so much more potential than they thought they that they did. So that's how we came up with the mission because I do think animation is the most beautiful thing in the world and I think VR just takes that to a, another step because now you're actually in the world. You like really believe that that thing is real. Marina, I want to ask you on a, a kind of a some, some personal level, like, you know, you kind of started talking out, but when you started talking, you said your first aspiration was actually to go to art school, and then you went to business school, and you worked, you know, we met you at Pixar as an intern in production, and then you went on to Zynga to do great things there, and now you've got working with Baobab. Your kind of uh, creative fulfillment, working in this capacity between you and Eric, is that, do you feel like it's fulfilling in that way, or is that something that you continue to search? There was a certain point, I hope it's okay to talk about, where you were learning to paint, and you were taking and painting classes. Good too. And they were, yeah, they were looking really promising. Yeah. Like, is that something that's still a part of your career and your life, I guess, right now? Or is this kind of fulfilling that? Um, I think the favorite part of my day is reviewing all the creative things that people are making and engineering, like we walk around people's desks and actually see what they're working on. And that gives me great happiness because then my creative input matters. <laughs> so absolutely. That being said, to be honest, when you're a CEO, um, an entrepreneur, you have to do lots of things that you never thought you would have, right? So when you are part of a big company, you don't have to think about, where do I get office supplies? <laughs> or like mm -hmm. HR department, <laughs> or like what kind of contracts do you have to write? So a lot of those things I do have to do now, so I don't have um, as much time to just focus on the creative, but that's why like Eric mm -hmm. is a badass creative. <laughs> so I completely 100% trust him, but he knows what drives me, right? The reason why I ever wanted to do business or do anything related to this field is because, because in general, entertainment doesn't make sense as a business. <laughs> Not a very smart business to be in because it's a history of business. So part of you does it because you can't help it because you love, you love the artistry of it. So there's something slightly irrational about it. And his knowing that he makes sure to pull me into all these review meetings to make sure I still get that creative fulfillment um, out of it. But I'm hoping as we expand, of course, I can hire additional people that can take on like HR and some of these functions so that I can um, do even more of what I really love doing, which is um, production. But I don't think I'm not the person that's going to be doing all the drawing and all that because we have Cody and these people are much more talented, honestly, than I am. But just being able to help enable people to be able to do that, I think that's enough for me. Awesome. But you guys should feel free to teach me. <laughs> stuff on the side. I still draw stuff, but more for my friends. So it's mm. more for fun. After seeing all these amazing people and you guys, it's all your faults. <laughs> you're like, I'm never going to be like that. So it's demoralizing. I'm kidding. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, I'm, I'm really kind of... Uh, Eric, you, you really had a career that I think, you know, you, us starting in our film kind of making career as directors, you know, we're looking at kind of what you've done and thinking even, you know, looking at Gas Plan and how experimental that was and to see the credits list. We're so used to CG credit lists that just go on forever and to see like essentially two people, yourself and someone else doing like the art direction, directing, animating everything on, on that first film through directing all these feature films at PDI DreamWorks, and now you're kind of taking this other leap into VR, directing uh, these short short content. What is your aspirations? What, what's kind of the world you see creatively? I mean, it, as a director, as an artist, um, you know, what, are you, what are you looking to achieve here? What's really kind of, what could you say is like successful, I guess? What, what are you shooting for? Well, I think at the, at the end of the day, for me, it's 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 going to be primarily the same thing. I think that it was when I started, which is just doing, making stuff that um, that I like, <laughs> um, and and what that's become um, these days is really uh, making stories with characters that are compelling 
and um, you know a lot of the credit to that goes to the animation as well. You know, I think that that really high quality animation that doesn't mean it has to be Disney style or any other style, but really high quality animation where you can understand what's going on inside of a character's head, um, and. And, and connect with those characters and care about what they care about and want what they want or maybe want them to get what they need if it's not what they want. All those things, I think that's, that's what I've sort of come to see is the way to do that stuff that I can enjoy myself and then also um, can find an audience um, of people that, that will assure me that I can keep doing these things. Um, I don't want to live in a mud hut anymore. Um, <laughs> those days are over. So, um, you know, I, that's why we have um, animators with feature film experience doing the animation for us. Um, is it, it's, it's really important that we provide the kind of animation that gives the subtle cues that we need to connect with these characters as if they are living, breathing things. I don't think um, I, I'm going to care about them nearly as much if, if, if we don't do that. So that's what gets me excited, you know. It's what gets me up in the morning and coming into work. You know, I tend to like comedic stuff, um, but I'm really looking forward to um, kind of spreading our wings at Baobab and not necessarily having a particular style, either in terms of how things look or in the kinds of stories that we tell. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, I'm really looking forward to um, the time, which I hope is sooner than later, when um, we've got the kind of engineering backbone and pipeline backbone and production tools backbone that people want to come and do creative work with us, you know, so that Visionaries, wherever they are, can come into Baobab and create great pieces of VR entertainment. Um, but yeah, at the end of the day, it, it's it's about the same thing I said earlier. It's just you know having a great story, hopefully telling it well, hopefully with characters that you can really fall in love with. And I'd love it if we could create you know whatever our version could be of like a Mickey Mouse or or a Woody or a Buzz or you know something that like you know. You're walking through an airport, and there's a kid holding, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. I know Lasseter always said that was a, the first time he saw a kid with a, with a Woody doll mm -hmm. somewhere, you know. That's when he realized, ah, oh, I've actually done it. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I'm, actually, I'm somebody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course, he was somebody long before that. But um, there's, a real, there's a real satisfaction, I think, in just in touching people. And a great example, I think, is... For me, one of those satisfying moments is when we were screening one of the Madagascar movies um, for audiences before it was released. And afterwards, you know, everybody fills out a questionnaire, and then a few people will stay back. They're asked to stay back and, and answer questions that a moderator asks of them. And um, he said, what's your favorite character? And, and there was a group of kids in the front row, and one little boy raised his hand and he said, I like Melman. Melman is the giraffe in Madagascar. And he said, oh, you like Melman? How come? Why do you like Melman? And the kid said, because he's too tall. And he, it wasn't because he was tall. It was because he was too tall. And so that, I knew I had that kid, you know, because he fell in love with Melman. He, understand, he understood Melman's weaknesses, and that mattered to him enough that Melman became his favorite character. Not because he was a, a hero, but because this kid you know, made this connection with him. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's cool. That's so cool. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you had talked a little bit about if Invasion was what you thought it was going to be in the beginning, it, it might have, not failed, but I mean, that you kind of... It might have failed. Might have failed. <laughs> what, what was it that, you know, entering VR, I think all of us, at least in my head, I think of the 90s and, you know, all that kind of, uh, I don't know, almost... Some of the stuff we saw at first was almost like screensavers and, and that sort of thing. But obviously VR has evolved a lot from then. What was your first inclination for an invasion that you you realized through the process? Um, um, I think it was primarily a, a lot of little things um, that just come from, come, came from not understanding the medium. One of the things that was important to us 
for both creative reasons but also practical reasons, is that um, we could not give the timing um, and the pacing of the story over to the viewer. Um, one of the one of the markets that we want to be a part of, um, because it's going to be the biggest market, is mobile, and mobile phones are powerful enough now that VR can become a viable mass market medium. But they're not that powerful, you know. Mm -hmm. It's hard to do stuff um, that's highly interactive. It can be done, but it, it's it's difficult. And so what we wanted to try to do was to have a, a narrative where um, it was already completely paced, that the, that the viewer was not going to have any control over making things start or stop, no branching storylines, um, and it was just plop the viewer down in the middle of it and let the story play out in front of them. And um, that's all well and good unless the viewer decides, now I'm going to look up and watch the clouds roll by, and they miss an important story beat. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning... The piece was filled with moments where the audience, t on, in general, didn't know where to look, um, or was looking at the wrong thing, um, or didn't care about something enough. Or, I mean, you know, one example, one simple example is that the spaceship appears after the bunny has greeted you out on the ice and, um, and uh, flies behind this stand of trees. And then there's a few seconds there where you don't see the ship but you can hear it getting louder, obviously getting closer. And of course, in, in VR, the sound is, is very spatialized. So it's like the sound of that ship is coming from right over there, and it's getting louder, it's coming my way. And so in cinema, this is a great time to build up some dramatic tension, you know? Let the sound really build and get, start to feel that bass as it gets closer. Let the music build up in intensity and um, until finally that ship breaks over the treetops in all of its glory and then rides, you know, just three feet over your head, massive lights, you know, rumbling, vibrating. Anyway, so I, when the ship was behind the trees, after about a couple seconds of this so-called dramatic build, even with the spatialized audio and everything else, people started looking around. This were, well, I can hear it, where is it? You know, they didn't even trust their own ears. They expected to see a ship. They didn't see one. And most people were looking 180 degrees off axis of where I wanted them to look <laughs> with this dramatic reveal happen. And, 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 then they, they're, and then they're confused. And then they look back. And the ship's now above their head. And they're missing that. And, 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 then, they're, they're, and then they start thinking in their head, you know, well, where does the filmmaker or the VR maker want me to look now? Because I'm obviously missing something. Mm. And as soon as you... As soon as you, the viewer is asking themselves that question, they kick themselves out of the experience. So the, the solution for that was to limit the amount of time before the ship appears. So um, now most people are still looking at those trees when that ship comes over the top. Much less dramatic build. It's just about a second and a half or maybe two seconds as opposed to the five or six that it was before. And, and the, the film is just peppered. I keep saying film, but whatever it is... Um, we need a name for these things, <laughs> um, is peppered with moments like that where um, we needed to do something to direct the viewer's eye, you know, or we had a sound to direct the viewer's attention somewhere, but it wasn't loud enough or it was the wrong sound. And it's just a lot of little things like that that you can only really um, know how to do from experience um, or in our case from putting headsets on people who had never seen it before and watching how they watched the thing, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we did a lot of that um, and made a lot of modifications and came up with something that for the most part, um, most people follow the story from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And they and this is a big thing for me, is like, I want to, now the viewer has freedom of choice to look anywhere, right? So I want to inspire the viewer to look to make the choice to look where I want them to look when I want them to look there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and if, if I'm doing that, then I believe that I'm being su successful. And this is another thing about games. It's always tended to bother me a little bit in terms of the story component of games, which is typically not the first number one goal anyway. But like you spend this time building up some, some narrative stuff, and then you stop and you flatline for a bit while you go and, and kill monsters or shoot down 
airplanes or whatever you're doing. And in fact, some of that narrative tension or excitement or whatever you build, you know, is lost for no other reason than you're waiting to get back into the story again. So by maintaining control of that arc to that emotional catharsis through the pacing and rhythm and timing and structure and all that other stuff, um, I think just by definition you can kind of have a better storytelling experience. Mm. So that's the tough part because you want the viewer to feel like they're there, that they can look wherever they want to look. You just want them to want to look where you want them to look. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. It's like a con you want the illusion of freedom and that everyone's making choices, but you want to kind of completely control that. I mean, it's like, I mean, I think of like theme parks like Disneyland and stuff where you walk in and you feel like you can go anywhere, but it's really a controlled experience. Mm -hmm. um, that's so fascinating. I mean, um, it's also interesting because I feel like with the uh, experience in film, there are certain conventional things like a cut or that don't seem to apply as much, or they're, they're at least applied in a different way in filmmaking. And like, how do you guys, like, the, like for instance, simple thing, uh, we were talking a little bit about it before, but storyboarding, do you storyboard a VR experience or how does that work? Like, cause when I think of, you know, making film, like that's the first thing we go to is like, oh, let's write and storyboard it and just beat it out. And do you guys also storyboard for VR? Experience? Yeah, we've done some storyboarding, you know, I think, even if you're not doing um, doing layout per se or, or shot specific boarding, um, you can do boarding for the moments, you know, um, so that you understand where the characters' heads are at and agree upon that before we, you get into the expensive and time consuming um, part of animating it all. And that can be done. I, I mean, I think early Disney boarding was a lot like that. You know, there was no background. It wasn't necessarily the shots that were going to be in the in the movie as much as I think a lot of boards today tend to show the environment and suggest cinematography. Um, but it was just about what's happening with the characters or more about that. So you can do that kind of storyboarding. I know some people are trying to take, uh, you know, their paper storyboards or their Cintiq storyboards and sort of place them place these rectangles in space um, to try to sort of give you a sense of where things will be staged. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I just think at the end of the day, we need, we need to rethink all the, all the tools that we have in VR to be tools that will work in VR mm -hmm. <laughs> and tools that are best for VR. And there really are no VR authoring tools right now. And so that's one of the efforts that, that you know, is going on in, in, at Baobab is sort of having those discussions and, and in, engineers getting involved in what, what are the kind of tools that would really make us efficient and effective in VR because we're in VR and not just stuff that we're, we're just pulling from, um, from traditional filmmaking mm -hmm. production um, flow and, and pr traditional pipelines and all that other stuff. It's all stuff to be discovered. So, so Eric, I'm just curious, I mean, whether it's VR or film, like, where do you get ideas from? Um, you know, I think part of it is just sort of having an open mind and open eyes and, you know, story ideas can, can come from anywhere. Um, and, you know, I, I think having the idea is good, but then what's next is developing into something that's going to be an entertaining story for everybody. And, you know, one of the things that I think was even true back in the early days of Disney is that, um, you know, Walt Disney believed that a great idea could come from anybody. So we try to keep our minds open and our ears and eyes open to everybody in the studio as well and encourage people to contribute. Um, for example, um, Matchek, our animator, Matchek Liwa, uh, who sort of heads the animation team, has come up with a ton of really great additions to even invasion that help make that a, a better told story mm -hmm. and um, you know and, and we just encourage that and, and frankly you know he's I'd love to hear it when he's got something to offer because um, it, it, it's usually a great idea and we can integrate it in and I know he's already um, off working on his own ideas too that he's hoping um, to bring to VR as well so um, you know that's also something that we want to keep an open mind to and um, you know, and then he's also been 
really great with working with his team of animators and, and pulling ideas from them. And um, so it's kind of just about, you know, creating an, an environment where people feel like um, they can speak up and that. I think it's a uh, there are a lot of story uh, content VR studios maybe not a lot but then there's a handful of really established places like Google is doing them and story studio and the Pembroke's and those guys but it seems like you guys especially because of Eric's experience probably the most established proven feature film quality director doing the VR, that like kind of puts you guys in this sort of special spot, I feel like, among the leading kind of storytelling VR companies. And uh, I, I just really get excited to, to, to see what you would do, like, you know, it's just because you know how to tell a story from the best form of animation, at least up, to, up until now, possible. And uh, yeah, we, we can't wait to uh, come out and check it out, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we do think that right now for VR, because it's so early, uh, it is a lot of the initial excitement is about the technology. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but as with every single medium, the technology, the novelty of the technology mm -hmm. will eventually wear away and the things that will still matter at the end of the day are still what Eric was talking about is the characters and the story. Um, so really honored and lucky to have someone like Eric who has that storytelling experience. I always like to point out that Eric wasn't only the director, right? Um, one of the co-directors of the Madagascar yeah. films, but he was also involved in the writing oh, um, and with the script writing for them. And so that's really big too. And we want to create a culture also that's different. So from all the different places <laughs> I've been, including Pixar, which was wonderful. I al always feel that there's this oftentimes healthy tension between business and creative. And I was always wondering, and I needed to prove this to myself, and I'm trying to prove this to myself in this company, that there is a way to um, have both of them be equal and one not stepping on the other's toes. It was really funny for Pixar, I remember talking to someone in the finance department a long time ago and he was saying, oh, it's hard to justify making a film about rats trying to cook or a half-silent film about robots falling in love and it made, it, they ended up being beautiful. So you definitely need that leap of art, but he was like, oh, it kind of makes me nervous because it's difficult to market something like that. But then on the other hand, um, if you go all the way towards just business and you don't allow the creative to flourish, then there's nothing to sell, especially since you're selling an entertainment thing. So people have to be entertained. And to entertain people, I truly believe that entertainment product is a reflection of the team working on it and the personalities of the team involved. So if that team is not inspired and not excited, how can you expect that team to create something amazing? So while you do have to care about the business side and distribution, all that, it's about creating a culture that is great for creatives to be able to be inspired and do their thing. But also in the beginning of an industry when a lot of stuff is dependent on like getting funding, and all the businessy aspects, also keeping that in mind too without letting one step on the other's toes. I can't wait to see Invasion. Where, where can, just like a bit of business, where can people see Invasion? invasion. Right now, they can download um, the full version, actually, isn't even out yet. Um, the sneak peek is out right now, and that is available on the Gear VR, as well as it's a, you can download the app on the Gear VR and also on the Oculus Rift. Great, guys. Um, thank you so much for coming today, all the way from uh, Redwood Shore. Mm -hmm. uh, Really appreciate coming here. It's really nice to have you. Inspiring to meet you for the first time, Eric. Yeah, it's great to meet you guys. I'm a big fan. Thank you. Yeah, we'll come visit. Next great. Time. Yeah, look forward to it. Thank you.